Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to op-ed.tv. Fiscal crisis, a term that can send chills through New Yorkers, is emerging again. The New York Times recently had an ominous front page headline about the state of the city's economy heading into the post-pandemic era. It said simply, starkly, New York City slides to edge a fiscal crisis. I'm old enough to have covered the devastating fiscal crisis of the 1970s and the crisis that followed the tragedy of September 11, 2001, and the Great Recession of 2008-2009. We may not be experiencing anything as dire as those disasters, let's hope not, but the city is facing some enormous economic challenges. We'll talk about them and what the city can do about them with my guest, James Parrott, the Director of Economic and Fiscal Policies at the New School's Center for New York City Affairs. James, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. So this is not a rerun of the 1970s, um, but there are some problems, some, some problems the city has to navigate. Uh, there are some struggles ahead. Uh, economically, what do you think are the most serious ones? Yeah, well, so New York City uh, has, it was hit very hard early on by the pandemic when it was in its most, most lethal phase. Right. So that had a profound impact in, uh, you know, in, in leading to very strict business restrictions uh, that stayed in place probably longer than they did in most places. So we're still recovering. We've lagged the recovery. The nation has recovered all, all of the jobs, you know, it's back to where it was in February of 2020. Uh, of course, if we hadn't had the pandemic, we would have had millions right. more yeah, jobs in that, right. but, but at least the nation has recovered the jobs. New York City is, still has what I call a pandemic job shortfall of about 140,000 jobs. So we still have economic challenges from COVID. Then there is growing concern about the possibility of a recession related to the battle that the Fed is waging against uh, high inflation right. and interest rates rising and so on. Um, what's happened with supply shocks and so on contributed to the inflationary environment. The, the war, the Russian war in the Ukraine has, you know, unsettled a lot of things. So, so there are real concerns about an economic recession and should that occur, that will, you know, very likely reduce uh, city and state tax revenues and could complicate the city's fiscal situation. But, but I do think we're a long way from a fiscal crisis environment like right. the ones that you uh, reference. On, on top of all these um, issues that you correctly point out, we're also um, facing the issue of thousands of uh, migrants from Latin America coming into the city, some of them sent here deliberately uh, by the governor of um, Texas. Uh, and uh, that's caused a problem to the extent um, that the mayor has, um, uh, uh, I guess, issued a state, of an a state of emergency with regard to it. It's, it has overwhelmed the uh, homeless services uh, in New York. Um, my question, I guess, is, it's not clear to me how New York City navigates that kind of crisis um, when they're facing all these other things that you're talking about. Do yeah. you have any idea of how they're trying to do it? Well, uh, I mean, it seems like they are trying to come up with a reasonable approach to temporary housing and supportive services. And the nonprofit sector is aiding city efforts, uh, certainly. Um, but the, the refugee situation and um, the influx of uh, immigrants from across the southern border, you know, it really is a federal problem. Um, I know the governors of Florida and Texas have been talking about that for a while. The problem is their party has not been in support of any 
federal policies to deal with that in a humane, responsible way to care for people right. and to set up new immigration requirements and so on. So Going as far back as uh, George W. Bush and probably even before that, um, there were efforts to do immigration right. reform. And and, and and those have been thwarted, uh, you know, basically by conservative forces, right. uh, you know, uh, across you know, various sessions of Congress. So here we are in 2022, and New York City is facing a real challenge with this. It's very costly. New York City has a shelter requirement, so the city has no choice but to provide, you know, uh, safe and sanitary uh, shelter for refugee populations. That's very costly. There really needs to be federal aid uh, to assist with that. And if the federal aid isn't forthcoming, then New York State should assist New York City in that. So you mentioned um, the jobs issue in New York. So the country is back to uh, where it was in, I guess, February 2020 in right. terms of uh, employment. Um, and the city is not. Why isn't? Why is New York lagging behind? It's it's largely for for two reasons. In addition to the to the fact that New York City got hit hardest when the pandemic was at its most most lethal. Um, I remember you, you those know, days. But New Yorkers remember those days. There, there, there were no, there was no traffic right. in the street. And siren. You would hear sirens. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, all day and all night long, and so no on. No vaccines so, in those days. Right. Right, uh, that was a really scary and yeah. unsettling time. Um, so because uh, New York City has a large leisure and hospitality sector, which was the most affected of any sector right. of, the, of the economy, plus we have a large office-based economy. And you know, since the advent of the pandemic, there's been you know, a, a tremendous rise in remote working and people working from home and hybrid schedules with people in the office part of the time and so on. So you know, we used to have 1.2 million office workers in Manhattan uh, every day, many coming from uh, suburban uh, uh, environments around New York City. So that um, inbound commutation, those, that, that, that supply of office workers has really uh, diminished a lot. So less support for retail and leisure and hospitality jobs in Manhattan on, on top of the big hit that leisure and hospitality had with the pandemic. So, so New York City um, uh, it has been much more affected than other large cities. New York State much more affected than other large states uh, in the country. If you wanted to design an economic event that would have a concentrated impact on the people least able to afford it and not do anything to the rest of the economy, you'd be hard pressed to find something more effective than the pandemic in doing that because all of its uh, negative economic impact was concentrated on hourly workers, yeah. a lot of low wage workers, less educated, a lot of workers of color, who, people who can least afford to lose uh, pay from their job. At the other extreme, uh, office-based workers were relatively unscathed by this. There were some temporary you know, uh, dislocations and so on, but, but people are able to continue working, keep their incomes, keep their benefits, and so on. Many people enjoyed greater flexibility yeah. than before. So it's such a lopsided economic event, and we're still seeing that today. All of the jobs deficit that we have is concentrated in low paying industries. So, you know, that has exacerbated the great unevenness that we often see in New York City between white and black and Latinx unemployment rates. And so many of those low wage uh, workers, in addition to being the ones who um, bore the brunt of job losses, are the ones who did have jobs had so many jobs where they had to show up in person for Absolutely, work, even right. at the time, as you were pointing out, when the pandemic was at its most, most lethal. Um, so it was really a, a kind of a horrible situation. Now, complicating this jobs issue is it, an, an issue that you've spent quite a bit of time on. And um, you've been talking about how policymakers should deal uh, with, the, with the employment issue in New York. And uh, you've said that uh, a real economic recovery for, for the city uh, will hinge 
on how policymakers deal with this jobs issue. And, and specifically, you talked about improving the quality of jobs and also ensuring steadily rising wages of right. workers. Many of these workers would be the lower wage right. um, workers. Now, the question becomes, how do you do that in an environment in which revenues are, are declining? And most economists do think that we're heading for uh, some sort of recession, even if it is a mild one. Right. Well, in terms of the fiscal capacity of the city and the state, I think uh, both city and state budgets are in pretty good shape. The state budget is in the best shape that it's been in the past 50 years or so, uh, between strong revenues coming out of the pandemic and federal aid um, and a temporary uh, tax increase on high income people. Um, the state budget is in, is in great shape, so we have the economic wherewithal. I don't think it necessarily takes a lot of money to address these problems. I think it takes an, uh, a, an active labor market strategy. I would characterize what New York City has done in the wake of previous recessions with regard to the labor market as a laissez-faire approach. Right. Basically, stand back and sort of let the, let the uh, labor market adjust on its own. And the consequence of that has been <clears throat> that we've seen uh, several years of um, double-digit black unemployment rates fo following the early 90s right. recession, which was much more severe in New York City, the early 2000s recession after 9-11, after the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. The historical record is unmistakable. A laissez-faire labor market approach is bad for uh, low-income communities bad for black workers, particularly bad for young male black workers who have sky-high unemployment rates in those periods. So I think uh, coordinating uh, you know, representatives from the employer community, from labor unions, from nonprofit providers, from the city agencies that have uh, a hand in uh, employment programs, the Department of Social Services, the Small Business Services, Department of Youth and Community Development, CUNY, the Department of Ed, <laughs> bringing everybody together, I think, can identify what the emerging skill needs are, connect with the people who are dislocated, connect with the people who are interested in trading up to better jobs and providing them with the skills and the supports that they need in order to, 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 to gain those additional skills. And that way we can foster better employment. We need to Along with that, we need to focus on improving the quality of jobs. And a lot of that has to do with raising the wage floor. We had a situation in the years before the pandemic where we more than doubled the minimum wage in New York State. It went from $7.25, the federal minimum, to $15 at the end of 2018. Which made a real difference. It made a huge improvement for the first time in 50 years, raised the the wage share of people in the bottom half of the income distribution reduced child poverty by over a quarter yep. over that period. Overall poverty went down uh, as well. Um, it, we had a stabilization of this long-term trend since the late 1970s in income polarization. Right now, there's an effort to, to uh, index the state minimum wage, which hasn't been raised in New York City since uh, the beginning of 2019 and to have a catch-up increase because, because we haven't had uh, uh, inflation indexing to the minimum wage. The purchasing power of the minimum wage has fallen quite a bit in New York City. So if we, if we raise wages, you know, I give the Adams administration a lot of credit for acting recently to raise the minimum mm -hmm. compensation standard for four hire vehicle drivers, the Uber and Lyft drivers, raising the taxi fare so that you know, all of that increase in the taxi fare is going to go into the pockets of taxi cab drivers. Um, also, they're working on setting up a minimum compensation standard for restaurant uh, delivery workers. Those policies affecting so-called gig workers and independent contractors will lift the wages for 200,000 workers in New York City. That's the sort of action we need to help raise living standards in New York City. So if, if we're able to maximize the reemployment of people dislo dislocated by the pandemic and allow them to trade up to better jobs and raise the wage floor, I think we can have you know, a solid economic recovery in New York City. And it doesn't necessarily require a huge you know, further investment 
uh, from the city. You uh, mentioned something that a lot of New Yorkers have been talking about, and, and that is the fact that um, uh, remote work has taken hold. I don't know if it's going to last you know, yeah. forever, but it's, it's certainly uh, the case now. A lot of people are working remotely. And um, so we have these office towers, these enormous office towers, and um, th they're far from full now. And then you also mentioned the residual businesses in the, in the neighborhoods right. where these towers uh, are, uh, which also employ a, a, great, a lot of people. But when we discussed this um, um, before the program, you didn't seem to think that this was as serious a problem as some others have said. Explain why. Well, I think the real estate market is, is, is one market that can um, readily adapt uh, through price changes. That is, if rents come down and the sale prices of buildings come down, there will be interested tenants and buyers. And we've already seen some, you know, new leases signed and so on. You know, it wasn't, it was only a few months ago that uh, the state approved uh, a massive Penn Station redevelopment project that was premised on massive office building construction in the Penn Station area. Now, why is there real estate developer interest in that? Because they assume that in the long run, New York City's office market is gonna come back. There'll be demand not only for existing space, but for new space uh, that's likely to, to be more expensive and so on. So, so I think the real estate community you know, they're always optimistic, but, uh, but, 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 but I think, you know, there's, there's reason to believe that, assuming that the U.S. economy doesn't, you know, uh, spiral down into some sort of, you know, long-term economic funk, that there's a bright future for New York City's economy. We've had a growing tech sector, a growing healthcare sector. Um, a lot of startups are still occurring in New York City. A lot of people come to New York City for that purpose and so on that economic, underlying economic dynamism in New York City is still there. And I think that will, that will help address the, 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 the current problems in the real estate market. And, and I do think that we, we will see some element of hybrid work continue uh, into the future. Um, but there will be, you know, uh, real estate developers will think of creative ways to reuse those buildings. What about the um, the other businesses in those neighborhoods? Right. Do you think that they'll, um, well, how well do you think they'll recover? Will they recover somewhat? Do you think they won't recover fully? What's your best guess? Well, a lot of, a lot of small businesses that were sort of in that category in leisure and hospitality and support services for, for offices, um, a lot of them have already uh, closed their doors because they weren't able to stay open. Um, the federal aid wasn't as well targeted as it could have been, um, and it didn't help all of the small businesses that needed that. Um, I think in general, though, we've seen, you know, a healthy rate of new business formation in New York City, and I think dislocated workers will find employment opportunities in some of the growing businesses and in some of the new industries and so on, and the focus should be on helping workers get the jobs where the demand is occurring. Now, an issue where you seem to think um, there really is um, a very serious um, problem and potentially long-term is with regard to the transit system. Right. Um, why do you think that's so problematic? Well, it's, it's problematic because for too long, the MTA has relied, uh, has over relied on the fare box right. to fund its revenues. The fare box share of transit operating revenues is greater in New York City than it is in other places around the country. So with fewer passengers uh, on the subway and the commuter rail lines, the revenues coming into the MTA are gonna suffer. It will help, oh, it's supposed to help on the capital side to have the congestion pricing plan. So hopefully, you know, the New Jersey governor's objections to that will not, <laughs> will not prevail and, and we'll get that. I think that will help on a number of fronts that will provide some needed revenues. But in the end, you know, there's an argument that, that uh, as, as the country is trying to better adapt to climate change, uh, we should be encouraging, uh, 
you know, activities like mass transit. So there should be, hopefully in the future, right. we'll see more operating capital support for mass transit. Uh, this is another issue, though, where you really need uh, federal assistance, right? I, I mean, much like you need it with housing, we haven't talked about yeah. housing, but you need federal assistance with housing. Actually, you need f the federal government to be building affordable housing. Um, uh, but also with the migrant issue, uh, with refugees and that sort of thing, you need federal assistance. Um, it just seems to be a, a, an environment in which that kind of federal system is not forthcoming. It isn't, but a lot of people were surprised at how readily the federal government did respond when the pandemic occurred. Right. And the volume of federal aid was far beyond what anybody could have imagined before. So when the circumstances are right, you know, it would be better that, you know, that we don't have to wait for an all out crisis uh, for the federal government to respond, but we really do need, you know, a more effective federal partner uh, that's able to address some of these problems that are that are clearly in the best interest of the country as a whole. In the meantime, though, I think there's a lot that New York City and New York State should do, and again, it's it's very positive that the state budget is in better shape than it's ever been before. Uh, and, and in, in shape to help New York City right. through some of these problems. Uh, an issue um, we haven't touched on, but which is sort of a perennial issue in New York. Uh, New York City always has enormous pension obligations. Yeah. I mean, um, municipal workers and uh, fire, teachers, um, um, police officers, and on and on and on, sanitation workers. Um, and um, that uh, uh, keeping those at a, at a, a, a re having a reasonable income for your uh, your pension so that you can continue to pay them right. decade after decade um, requires that the money be invested wisely, and a lot of that money is invested on Wall Street. Right. Um, and Wall Street's been in trouble for a while now. It was soaring during the pandemic, and now it's been right. running in the opposite direction since then. How much trouble is New York City in right now when it comes to its pension obligation? Well, so there's a lot of focus on, on what's happened recently. And, you know, so the, the pension uh, funds fiscal year ends June 30th. So state controller did a report saying that, you know, projected that, you know, where the, where the funds ended, uh, where they were at June 30th and projected that the city would have to increase its, its pension contributions in years ahead, starting in 2024 to, to allow for that. Well, last year this time, the city was, the opposite thing happened. The stock market returns affecting pension funds were greater than what was anticipated, and the city was putting more, more money into the budget. So, you know, Wall Street does go in cycles. I don't expect that we're gonna see, you know, a long-term decline in the, in the stock market. There's nothing, you know, short of World War III Right. Uh, there, there's nothing on the horizon that's going to indicate that Wall Street is going to stay down for a long period of time. The next time it comes up, and it could be that revenues, that, that, that Wall Street returns are greater than what was forecast for the pension funds, and more money will be put back in. So it really is a year-to-year -year thing, and right now happens to be a year when the projections are we're going to have to pay more. Last year it was the reverse. The city could reduce its pension contributions because of, uh, quote, excess returns. Uh, you, you've mentioned that the, um, a couple of times that the state government is in good shape in terms, in terms of uh, its budget, right. in terms of its resources and its ability to help New York City. Um, are there other reasons why, and we started off talking about, you know, people talking about a potential fiscal crisis, and we're saying it's not as bad as uh, some of the real major crises uh, we've endured over the right. past um, several decades now, I guess. Um, are there other reasons besides the health of the state budget that make you optimistic that New York will be able to weather this storm in reasonably good shape? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, the, the city budget does depend heavily on the revenue, uh, revenues that can be generated from economic activity in New York City. And I, I got, you know, I'm fairly optimistic about the long-term economic prospects for New York City. New York City has been very resilient through all sorts of economic events over the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, and it is in the process of, you know, adapting in the wake of the pandemic. And I think 
Uh, the, and you know, I, I looked recently to see that there were 20 industries in the city's economy that had ga gained jobs since the pandemic. Right. Um, altogether, over 100,000 jobs, and those were, you know, some of those were in home health care jobs and warehouses. You know, there's been a shift, you know, through e-commerce. Fewer people working in brick and mortar retail stores, more people working in warehouses, distribution centers, and de delivery operations. There was also an increase in healthcare jobs, an increase in tech jobs, in line with the growth in tech around the country. And then there was some increase, even in the financial services and professional services uh, industries and advertising and so on. You know, so, so even in this very you know, unsettled economic period in New York City, many industries across the board are increasing employment. So that, that gives me you know, some uh, optimism that the city's economy is, is very resilient um, and that it will, will thrive in the future, you know, unless there are major roadblocks put in its way. Yeah. So we're going to close on that optimistic note. Um, James Parrott, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Bob. Uh, I'm Bob Herbert. Uh, that's all for now, and uh, see you next time.